I'm uh, super excited to present our next speaker, Iri Drogov, to you. Um, although most of you will, I guess, be familiar with something that she did, a book that she wrote, or her teaching work, or curatorial work, I'll give you a very short, brief introduction. Uh, Iri Drogov is a professor for, um, of visual cultures at the Goldsmith University, which is a department that she has founded in 2002. She's also a curator and has organized numerous conferences and exhibitions. As a part of the collective Free Thought, Rogoff will be one of the artistic directors of the next Norwegian Triennale de Bergen Assembly in 2016. And she's currently developing a new practice of knowledge production and exploring their impact on modes of research. This project will be published next year and it will be called The Way We Work. Tonight's talk will be connected to her current research. Her speech, Creative Practices of Knowledge, will pose questions about the circuits and the concepts of knowledge about professionalism and amateurism, about being in or outside an academic discipline. Informed by Michel Foucault's notion of knowledge formations, Rogoff will introduce us to the current different forms and more experimental expansions of knowledge. Production, for example, via practice-based research in and outside academia. She says, in this instance, I want to pay as much attention to the knowledges themselves as we do to the demands put on them, the structures that house them, the strictures that police them, and the rhetorics that they are embedded in. So please welcome Irid Rogov. Hello. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to join you. Um, aside from... Aside from talking about what I want to talk about, I also would want very much to distance um, this discussion from what we heard yesterday from James Elkins, um, from the neoliberal managerialism of neoliberal managerialism of knowledge. Um, so the, the, and, and to, to do so for a series of what to me are compelling reasons, which have to do with the fact that um, were this not perceived as important, there would not be this excessive amount of writing about contemporary practices of knowledge. Were it not perceived as ungovernable, there would not be such an enormous effort to constrain it and bureaucratize it and, and categorize it. So the, the sort of, of um, and were, were the work not perceived to elude definitions constantly, there would not be this effort to overdefine it and, and, and constantly deal with its, its quantification um, you know, invent various phantasmatic modes of, of, of um, kind of understanding its, its, its quality and its contribution and so on. So it is with the vitality of the work, with the politics of permission that underwrite it, with the necessary emergent forms of collaboration that it requires, uh, with the transgenerational dialogues that it enables that I would like to stay and to recognize that all the evils, which are entirely true, that Jim brought up yesterday evening are there because the work has been earth-shaking. And had it not been earth-shaking, none of this kind of vast structure um, of bureaucratic managerialism would probably have been necessary. So it is for these reasons that I want to distance myself. Um, entering the discussion in the wake of such historic models as Black Mountain College, the Bauhaus, Shanti Niketan, Rabindranath Tagore's Utopian University in West Bengal, Boyce's Free International University, Das Arts in Amsterdam, homework in Beirut, and dozens of others. We need to think far beyond avant-garde models in the realm of art. We need to think where these initiatives got their permission and their drives. We need to understand 
what their connections were to notions of radical pedagogy and the pedagogy of the oppressed. We need to understand how they constitute alternative political platforms. Now, the, the sort of, of the question of permission is absolutely crucial for me at this particular moment. And it has to do with the fact that this is not, you know, uh, a pizza menu from which one orders this form of work or that form of work. That permission is something that we struggle for, something that we have to legitimate, something that we arrive at um, through a great deal of not just experimentation, but through friction. And so the, the sort of, of, and one of the things that I think are really interesting in the genealogy of the, the sort of, of models of alternative models of education as they have come up is that each one of them gets their permission from a completely different set of problems. So that I, I don't think we can have one of those sort of, of avant-gardist models where this begat, that begat, that begat, that. Because what Rabindranath Tagore was, was battling against in, in West Bengal um, in 1919 is entirely different from what the people of the Bauhaus were dealing with, what the, the sort of, of, of people were dealing with in the 70s and the 90s and in the beginning of the 21st session, sec, um, century. And in each case, it's really imperative that we understand what the drive is and how that drive allows them to arrive at a sense of permission and how central permission is to, to the trajectory of opening up possibilities for people. That sort of 50% of, of the work of progressive education is the ability to arrive at permission oneself and the ability to convey permission underwritten by a lot of serious work to those um, who you're engaged in a collaborative pedagogical project with. So although I recognize the grim truth of what much of what Jim Elkins was saying yesterday about the complete bureaucratization of emergent research modes, I nevertheless would like to put forward the counter argument about the immense value, energy, and political engagement of the actual work that I see around me. I do my fair share of sitting on committees, on funding councils, on evaluation exercises, and am aware of what has happened to the formal perception of knowledge under the regime of cognitive capital. Knowledge is supposed to be applicable, transferable, profitable, accessible, and it should not in any way be critical. Within the neoliberal management of higher education and research, we're not content, we're not content or substance driven, but through the forms that either fulfill a set of pre-established criteria, which are deemed to answer the demands of research, or it is supposed to network itself in the world so that it becomes a series of multi-user platforms. However, in my daily life with students and colleagues, I experience it very differently. First of all, the people who gravitate towards the programs we run at Goldsmiths are what we, I would call the disenchanted. My classroom is a pantheon of disenchantment. It echoes with the strong voices of those who have lost faith in how to know in any conventional sense and are in the process of trying to self-institute towards another pathway into knowledge, into acts of knowing. The voices of the authors echo with the voices of the readers, learners who view acts of self-initiation or inauguration into knowledge as the performative gestures of this pantheon of disenchantment that drives everything in the pedagogical milieu of which I speak. The disenchantment I am so drawn to is not a protesting one, though it is profoundly critical. It is not an oppositional one, 
reproducing the binary logics of antagonistic opposites, though it keeps the enmity of ideas in mind. And it is not a form of resistance, though it does take the form of action rather than of analysis. If the disenchanted do not enlist declamatory rhetoric to raise their voices, how do they operate? Equally, the colleagues and friends I work with curatorially and organizationally gather together in order to move ideas around, out of the university and into the realms where they might function differently, engage with other audiences and other knowledges, create a different kind of awareness. The artists whose work I value and have learned from see their practice is how to enter the urgent questions of the day through other registers, other methodologies. They take up knowledge and queer it in ways that allow it to play, that, are in, that allow it to, to, to play in ways that are different from the endless repetition of what we already know, what we already know how to know. For those of you that have been to the recent Venice Biennale, the work of Samson Kambalu caught my eye. Samson Kambalu is a Malawian artist based in various Western capitals of the world. And he intervenes in a very European debate between Gianfranco Sanguinetti and his translator. Gianfranco Sanguinetti was one of the founders of the Situationist International, and his translator at this moment is accusing him of being a fraud, a cheat, a liar, and all kinds of other things. And into this comes Samson Malawi, Sam Samson Kambalo, and positions himself as entirely legitimate presence at the heart of what looks like an insular and introverted European debate between a set of intellectuals about the political realm which they inhabit. And turns this debate from being the annals of the Situationist International to being the annals of global migration. So these are as much my realities as are the neoliberal structures for the daily management of knowledge. And what I'm interested in is what happens in the, in the gap between these two. What happens between the, the extreme coercion of the bureaucratic structures and the extreme disenchantment of those who arrive in our various spaces wanting some form of transformation. Recently, the annual lecture series known as the Wreath Lectures began on the BBC. This year, the lecturer was Martin Rees, the president of the Royal Society of Astronomy. He began by looking back to the 17th century emergence of aristocratic, self-taught scientific amateurs who gathered out of passionate curiosity about the natural world, formed societies, exchanged books, reviewed each other's experiments and theorems, and formed the first professional learned associations devoted to uncovering radical new knowledge, such as the Royal Society in, the 16, in 1660. When a dozen men gathered to hear the young Christopher Wren give a lecture on astronomy, in the discussion that followed, they decided to form a society for the study of the new and still controversial experimental philosophy. The motto they decided on for their new association was, take nothing on authority. A motto that still resonates with me today is I try and think about academic protocols and the academic authority of truth regimes and how these are constantly challenged by creative practices of knowledge. Later that same day, the day in which Martin Rees began his lecture series, 
a rather brilliant practice-based researcher at Goldsmiths underwent what we call the upgrade, which is the passage from a preliminary to the final phase of a PhD. On this occasion, three professors sat in a room trying to convince this brilliant young man that he could do whatever he wanted. Since he was clearly both serious in his research and passionate about his subject, we went on saying he could invent a narrative, decontextualize his objects, speak in any kind of voice, and in general, take as many liberties with his work as served his purpose. He, on the other hand, clung to the conventional academic protocols like a drowning man to a raft. How could he prove this? And how could he ground that? And what did he need to do to be taken seriously by a professional academic community that held him up, he felt, to higher standards of knowledge? There was something both comic and confusing about our trying to liberate him from scholasticism and from his belief that it was something, some mysterious realm that he needed to crack in order to enter the formal bastions of knowledge. Sorry, I have a feeling that at the hotel where they printed my paper, which has no numbering. Oh well. It'll have its own logic. <laughs> so across our university, we've been adamant in refusing a uniform model for practice-based research and on insisting that each project needs to develop its own methodology and its own structure. This does not mean that substantively we are more advanced, experienced, or no better than elsewhere that is grappling with such questions. On the other hand, oh, I think I know what happened here. Okay, this is going to now happen every single page. The first story, Martin Rees, refers to knowledge pre-signification. And the second story, the brilliant researcher who wants to be a proper academic, to knowledge trying to be liber liberated from over-signification, and somewhere between the two is the dilemma I'm trying to get at. Now, being neither naive nor romantic, I do not hark back nostalgically to the 17th century, to privileged amateur men sustained by colonial adventures, indentured laborers, vast estates, and arrogant entitlement. But I do want to keep hold of two of their formulations. The value of experimental philosophy and the edict to take nothing on authority. And I think that creative practices or knowledge are some of the ways in which we might grasp these and ensure that they do not cede to the endless pragmatic demands of knowledge protocols, outcomes, outputs, impact, constant monitoring of the exact usefulness of knowledge or its liability to follow the demands and the imperatives of cognitive capitalism to be portable, to be transferable, to be useful, to be flexible, to be applied, to be entrepreneurial, and generally integrated within market economies at every level. But my question is whether constantly dealing critically with the structures and with the protocols and with the demands is actually going to get us where we might need to be. Because my concern is with the actual knowledge 
and my belief is in its power. I should say at the beginning that I come from an institution that has had some 20 years of postgraduate degrees in practice-based research work. And not only in the arts, and this is really important, but also in anthropology, sociology, cultural studies, medias and communication, visual culture, and many, many others. In fact, of the 15 departments we have at our institution, I think um, there's hardly one that doesn't have some form of practice-based um, knowledge and, and de degree giving. Over these past years, with about 40 to 50 practice-based PhD students currently in three programs in my department, and with another 200 or so across the university, we have been adamant in refusing a uniform model for practice-based research and on insisting that each project needs to develop its own methodology and its own structure. This does not mean that substantively we're more advanced, experienced, or no better than elsewhere that is grappling with such questions. We do not. On the other hand, it certainly means that UK institutions of higher education have vigorously marketed this experience as a market advantage. But regardless of its instrumentalization by various dominant market strategies, it does provide an effective model for a resistance to a normative mainstreaming of academic research at the level of knowledge. Issues of asignification, of not adhering to a single level of meaning and of singularization of the new relational mode of both subjects and of knowledges are central to such a resistance. One of the limitations of the critical discussion we're having at present is that if we focus the discussion on the strictures and bureaucratic limits being imposed, we do not actually talk about the knowledge. Equally, if we pose the question through the so-called educational turn, we're talking about protocols but we, and we do not actually talk about the knowledge that is either circulating or informing or being put on display within these enterprises. When we focus on new formats, such as gatherings and conversations and open access sites of learning and teaching as modes of artistic activity that supplement the putting of objects on display, we recognize that market forces are as much countered by discursive practices across our field. And so the art world becomes the site of extensive talking. Talking emerged as a practice, as a model of gathering, as a way of getting access to some knowledge and to some questions, as networking and organizing and articulating some necessary questions. But did we put any value on what was actually being said? Or did we privilege the coming together of people in space and trust that formats and substances would emerge from these? So I want to pose questions about the circuits of knowledge that went from amateur to professional, from general to discipline based, and to currently understanding themselves at a progressive level at least as being undisciplined. Obviously, the vast body that Michel Foucault put into play with his historical analysis of knowledge formations and the assumptions that these have been based on are key here. But we have also been through a decade in which activist initiatives at countering institutional dominance of knowledge production and dissemination have also shifted the ground in terms of expanding the range of the possible formats available for learning. In this instance, I want to pay as much attention to the knowledges themselves as we do to the demands put on them, the structures that house them, the strictures that police them, and the, the rhetorics they are embedded in. So of late, my main focus has been the move from formats to substances of knowledge. 
there's an argument here that we should not be arguing formats with counterformats, structures with counterstructures, protocols with counterprotocols, that we need to find a completely different line of argumentation that is grounded in certain kinds of substantive shifts, the politics that drive them, and the permissions that make them possible. And that these are, to my mind, actually sort of potent tools with which to argue the neoliberal governance and, and, and um, organization of, of, of knowledge. To advocate for creative practices of knowledge is to advocate for its undisciplining. It is to argue that it needs to be viewed as an A-signifying practice that produces ruptures and affects within the map of knowledge. This is difficult since the legacy of knowledge we have inherited from the Enlightenment has viewed knowledge as teleological, linear, cumulative, consequent and verifiable, either through experimentation or through orders of logic and sequential argumentation. It is slippery to try and talk about the knowledge itself, slippery to avoid essentialism or notions of autonomy. Foucault's insurrection of subjugated knowledges come to mind, but not necessarily as I think he meant it in terms of repressed knowledges that come from less normative or less hegemonic positions of class or sexuality or epistemology. Perhaps a contemporary notion of such an insurrection of subjugated knowledges is to do with their pursuit of unfitting bodies of knowledge from their accepted frames, leaving their place within the chain of argumentation and drawing to themselves unexpected companions, company that can provide paradigmatic challenge rather than affirmation. A signifying knowledge for Deleuze and Guattari, an A signifying rupture is a process by which the rhizome resists territorialization or attempts to signify or name itself by an overcoding power. It is the process by which the rhizome break, breaks out of its boundaries, deterritorialization, and then reassembles or recollects itself elsewhere and else when, re-territorialization. Often assuming a new or shifted identity. In the classroom, A signifying ruptures are those processes students employ to avoid being just students that classrooms use to avoid being just classrooms, that content uses to avoid being just subject matters, and that teachers use to avoid being just teachers. A signifying ruptures are those various processes by which rhizomes proliferate, wallow, accrete, spread, shatter, and reform, disrupt into play, seeming chaos or anarchy. Now, I've been involved in a long argument around the concept of free. Um, and I think that the, the sort of, of the free that I'm interested in is a free that is informed um, to some extent by sort of internet marketization where the, the sort of, of the economy is not a direct line of payment for what one gets, but the kind of deferral um, of, of payment through a set of, of processes on the one hand. And on the other hand, the, the ever-increasing burden of tuition fees on education. Now, uh, you know, we in, in Britain um, are operating under 
uh, absolutely enormous tuition fees. And um, it is my experience that what happens in Britain ha happens elsewhere in Europe um, a short time later. And so I um, be warned. And the, the sort of, oh, so the notion of free is linked partly to these particular kind of um, economies. But it's also um, linked to something that I think Umberto Eco argued in his novel, The Name of the Rose. Uh, he talked about, in, in English, it, it, it sounds condescending and unpleasant category. Um, he talked about what happens when what he calls the simple get hold of the testament, right? So the testament being in translation from Latin um, comes into the hands of what he calls the simple. And the simple for him are those who have faith that is not anchored through a great learnedness about the faith. And the fact that this completely and totally sort of undermines all of the authoritative structures of faith. And, um, and my sort of, of interest in free is around that. So I've tried to argue that education needs to engage with the notion of free. Obviously, it is not the romance of liberation that I have in mind here in relation to free. The kind of knowledge that interested me in the proposal that I made to the university was I, I was, I was sort of saying that because of, of the immense burden of tuition fees and the way in which it's creating a new social class of those who can be educated because you know, it's a question of who can, can get the loans, whose parents can take out another mortgage in order to pay for, for their education. What we need to do is sort of create something called Goldsmiths Free, which would uh, operate alongside with short, intense courses of absolutely cutting edge knowledge, right? So not extramural classes for adult education that, you know, simply explains kind of, of, of concepts, but to ask people in the institution to take the absolute heart of their research and turn it into a short, intensive course that is open and free. Because I think following Echo's notion of what happens when, you know, the so-called simple, and I wish he'd found a better word for it, um, have access to the testament. And, th and this is something that really interested me, and I thought, this is the way education can make an intervention. So this was the proposal. Needless to say, and I'm sure I don't have to, to tell you, I was laughed out of the room. So ridiculous was this notion sort of perceived. So the kind of knowledge that interested me in this proposal to the university was one that was not framed by disciplinary or thematic orders, a knowledge that would instead be presented in relation to an urgent issue. And not an issue as defined by knowledge conventions, but by the pressures and struggles of contemporaneity. When knowledge is unframed, it is less grounded genealogically and can navigate forwards rather than backwards. This kind of unframed knowledge obviously had a great deal to do with what I had acquired during my own experiences in the art world largely a set of permissions with regard to knowledge and a recognition of its performative faculties that knowledge does rather than is. But the permissions I encountered in the art world came with their own set of limitations. A tendency to reduce the complex operations of speculation to either illustration or to a genre that could visually exemplify study or research. I think Jim was talking about some of this yesterday. Could there be, I wondered, another mode in which knowledge might be set free without having to perform such generic mannerisms 
without becoming an aesthetic trope in the hands of curators hungry for the latest turn. Knowledge cannot be liberated. As it is endlessly embedded in long lines of transformation, which link in inexplicable ways to produce new conjunctions. Nor do I have in mind the romance of avant garde knowledge with its oppositional modes of innovation as departure and breach. Nor am I particularly interested in what has been termed interdisciplinarity with its intimation of movements between disciplines, and which de facto leaves intact those membranes of division and logics of separation and containment through a set of illusions of sharing. Finally, and I say this with some qualification, neither is my main issue here to undo the disciplinary and professional categories that have divided and isolated bodies of knowledge from one another with the aim of having a heterogeneous fill, field populated by bodies of knowledge akin to the marketing strategies that ensure choice and multiplicity and dignify the practices of epistemological segregation by producing endless new subcategories for inherited bodies of named and contained knowledge. There is a vexed relation between freedom, individuality, and sovereignty that has a particular relevance for the arena being discussed here, as knowledge and education have a foothold both in the processes of individuation and in the processes of socialization. Hannah Arendt expressed this succinctly when she warned that, and this is a long quote from Arendt, Politically, this identification of freedom with sovereignty is perhaps the most pernicious and dangerous consequence of the philosophical equation of freedom and free will. For it leads to either a denial of human freedom, namely, as it realized that whatever men may be, they are never sovereign, or to the insight that the freedom of one man or a group or a body politic can only be purchased at the price of the freedom, i.e. the sovereignty of all others. Within the conceptual framework of traditional philosophy, says Arendt, it is indeed very difficult to understand how freedom and non-sovereignty can exist together, or put it another way, how freedom could have been given to men under conditions of non-sovereignty. It's the end of quote from, from Arendt. And this is, I think, an absolutely essential question for us, that the loading of the notion of, of knowledge within education as having a potential, a li an emancipatory potential for freedom, and it's boxing up within endless non-sovereign protocols and, and, and structures. And in the final analysis, it is my interest to get around both concepts, freedom and sovereignty, through the operations of singularization. Perhaps it is knowledge de-individuated, de-radicalized in the conventional sense of the radical as breach, and yet operating within the circuits of singularity, of the new relational mode of the subject which is occupying me in this instance. And so, the task at hand seems to me to be not one of liberation from confinement, but rather one of undoing the very possibilities of containment. The, the sort of, what I mean by this is, and I think it's what I was trying to say at the beginning, that we can rail against the structures that confine us. But until we produce the models of knowledge that operate conceptually against the very possibility of containment, of the way in which knowledge is always contained, 
we have absolutely no way out of this conundrum. So while an unbounded circulation of capital goods, information, hegemonic alliances, populist fears, we see this with the current migrant crisis, newly globalized uniform standards of excellence, etc., are some of the hallmarks of a late neoliberal phase of capitalism. Nevertheless, we cannot simply equate every form of the unbounded, of that which militates against the conditions of containment. We cannot simply equate every form of the unbounded and judge them all as equally insidious. Free, in relation to knowledge, it seems to me, has its power in a centripetal movement outwards that isn't a process of penetrating and colonizing everywhere and everything in the relentless mode of capital, but in reaching unexpected entities and then drawing them back, mapping them on, onto the field of perception. Knowledge in the process of singularization is relational, but not necessarily aligned. As Sueli Rolnik argues, processes of singularization, a way of rejecting all these modes of pre-established encoding, all these modes of manipulation and remote control, rejecting them in order to construct modes of sensibility, modes of relation with the other, modes of production, modes of creativity that produce a singular subjectivity. Viewing notions of singularization, sorry, viewing notions of singularity and of processes of singularization as modes of coming together and producing relations and agendas that do not emanate from shared identities, shared ideologies, shared belief systems, or as Giorgio Agamben says, that come out of being red, being French, being Muslim, seems acutely relevant as much for knowledge as it is for political agency. Here, knowledge would exist in a relation, but not one of telos. Its framing would be its urgency in the world and not its epistemological legacy. And it would have the ability to form new and unexpected alliances in numerous directions, or in other words, to undergo processes of singularization. So the potential is that practice-based research might singularize knowledge rather than be neatly placed within its structures. That materials, associations, narratives, methodologies would pursue one another in unconventional modes. Art history and astrophysics, not just as bodies of knowledge, but as narrative structures they, as the narrative structures that they, that they are recounted in. Practice-based research then is a permission for knowledge that is tangential and contingent and whose sociability, as it were, its search for companionship is based not on linearity and centrality, but on dispersal. Thank you. As there are protocols, we have questions now, or we come go to the next. We have Do you have now. questions? Okay. Did anybody raise their hand? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I just wanted to ask um, about containment. This question of containment, and I. I wondered if you could say a little bit about the, 
the, the two tools of containment, the, the conference presentation and the, the monograph publication, in what ways would these other modes that you talk about interrogate that notion mm -hmm. that, of containment? Mm -hmm. hmm. I think, um, I, I, I think sort of part of the issue of containment, of the ability of knowledge to sort of appropriately stay in its place, has to do with our own sort of, of um, with, with our own un sort of understanding that um, <clears throat> the knowledge has to be up to the problems. So when the financial crisis in 2008 became evident and its global reach became evident, one of, one of the things that we were all sort of saying to each other is, oh, but we don't know enough economics to deal with this, right? I, I have to bring it into the classroom, but how will I bring it into the classroom? I don't know enough economics to actually deal with it in, in, as anything more than a lament, and we don't need any more lamentation. So the, the sort of, of, for me, part of the containment and part of why I so value creative practices of knowledge is because they produce different entry points into problematics. And so I, I don't think containment takes place at the level of you know, disciplined monographs or sort of, of, of subject panels and review boards or you know, all the crap that you and I had to sit through this year. Um, I, think, I think that to a very large extent, one of the things that we're suffering from is a set of self-inhibited you know, of, of, of self-inflicted inhibitions that tell us that we cannot deal with this because we don't have the knowledge. Because there is what an economist friend of mine calls the greater reality principle. Because somebody can always gra claim the greater reality because of a more specialized knowledge. So I think what when, when I'm talking about undoing the very conditions of containment, one of the things that, that we need to attack is the notion of expertise. And nobody attacks the notion of expertise in a more interesting and complex way than creative practices. You know, if you look at, let's say, Anna Teresa de Kirsmacher's kind of, 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 of last series of, of works, they're all about her inability to do what she wants to do with the expertise that she has available to her. And they're all about staging the impossibility you know, of expertise actually arriving at where she thinks she needs to get to. So I think rather than put it in the hands of really formal structures like monographs or subject panels, I think self-inflicted inhibition, a belief in expertise, a sort of, of an understanding that there's only one entry point into a problematic, that there have to be different ways of knowing something. And the more urgent the problem, the more important it is that we know it differently. So that's what I would say. It doesn't much help with the struggle against monographs. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned the radical pedagogy and also the pedagogy of the oppressed. Could you maybe tell something more about that? Well, I, I think um, the, the sort of, of, within the kind of knowledge economies that we are, are embedded in right now, uh, there's a, a, a taken for granted understanding that you know, the aim of study is a degree or a direct pathway into employment or into, the, into professionalization and the secure identity of something. One of the things that um, radical pedagogy models, and I'm thinking of, 
largely of Nelson Ferro, Henri Giroux, um, have to do with a recognition of education as a structure by which consciousness is transformed. And that seems so crucial as you know, part of, of, of the landscape that we are embedded in. And um, so I think, I think in part it's a kind of, of kind of thinking about what actually happens and what's the point of it. But it's also, I, I'm, I'm writing a little book right now called The Way We Work Now. And um, I've decided to sort of do six little chapters, each one on a term. And the one that I'm obsessing about all the time is this notion of permission. You know, of how do we get permission? What does that permission allow us to do? And I think that radical pedagogy, and certainly the pedagogy of the oppressed, have had a tremendous impact in this. And not just in sense of who's allowed in, it's not that kind of permission. Um, it's, it's the kind of permission that Brecht talks about, you know, in his plays, where the teacher wants to teach them to write these particular words, and they say, no, why can't we learn how to write revolution and, and you know, proletariat and, and so on. It's, it's the, the possibility of changing the vocabulary of the agenda. And that permission can only come from a struggle. You know, because otherwise it's consumerism. So not this model, that model, you know, it's all equal and I have access to everything and, and so on. So permission comes out of a sense of struggle. And one of the things that is really interesting is to try and see how many models of struggle for knowledge are sort of out there. And that's why I so value this notion of the disenchanted and the, the sort of, of the, the sort of, of to, to paraphrase Foucault, you know, the fact that all these people end up in our classrooms because they do not want to know thusly, right? And that, that's the most important thing about them because that's the energy, that's the drive, that's what will give them permission. Not wanting to know thusly. Somebody there? I have, a, I have a question directly related to uh, what has just been asked. Uh, to what extent do you think the institution that you are also a part of can be um, a site for this kind of struggle, or in which way can the institution be a sort of a partner in this struggle because from my understanding it it's kind of it has to come from the from another place right historically but i think that's that's the point of the argument around resingularization how does how does a classroom become more than just a classroom right how how can a classroom ex exceed the limits of its sort of 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 dictated role? How can it become the site of another set of discussions, other ways of knowing, the, the sort of, of the ability to try and articulate the urgencies, the questions? So it, it seems, I mean, it seems to me that we're involved in an extremely uneasy dance between a set of organizing strictures, which all of us who work in institutions are embedded in, there's, you know, and, and they're getting tighter and tighter, those strictures. And the reality of the discussion that actually takes place, where the, the sort of, of bulk of people um, in those classrooms actually want a great deal more than to further, you know, their opportunities. The, and, and not only that, but they also want to do it collectively which the system discourages them from. 
So there's, you know, and we are in an uneasy dance of trying to constantly kind of, of move between, between um, the two. And, you know, you also want people to, to have some idea of prior knowledges. You want, you know, it, it, it's not a, a teleological structure, but you want them to have a wide range of references. And all of that sits in a daily struggle with you know all the other components, and um, as one of my colleagues says, one day at a time. It's true. That's how you deal with it. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah. There's a, a guy there with a the mic, and there's one at the back, and then probably we should finish. No. Um, thank you, first of all, for these very inspiring ideas. Could you um, maybe expand a little more on your idea of Goldsmith Free? How, would, how should we envision that? Um, how would that work? <laughs> the, the sort of, of, of the unrealized project. Um, I think, I think, I mean, there were a few of us involved in this, and I think what what we really interested us is um, if what we produced were very small nodules of very intense and quite radically new knowledge, but that connected to major issues of the day. And that if we put this out, and we put this out to people who may not have an entire knowledge apparatus, what would they do with it? Would it be a jolt? Would it be boring? Would they leave by the dozen? Um, but we, we sort of, of, of thought, what would happen if we put unframed knowledge out on the table and see what people's sort of, of response to it is? And... Um, That was a message. So, the, but anyway, it, it's sort of all anybody wanted to know is what use would it be? Who would pay for it? You know, what kind of credit would it bring to the institution? How could we network it internationally? So it never got off the ground. It was just a pipe dream. I think one last one there. Uh, as a disenchanted student here. Um, uh, thank you for the coining that term, first of all. But uh, I was curious about, in your, in your um, section on free and the controversy surrounding that, you talked about this um, a mode of knowledge also mapping back onto the field of perception. Uh, to, so that is, and I was just really curious about how you've experienced that or seen that in your work and working with students to have this mapping back into perception and mm, yeah it's I, I think I, it's going to be a bit difficult for me not to be long-winded and it's the end of the day and I think I shouldn't be long-winded um, the, the, maybe maybe to turn the question around a bit and ask it slightly differently one of the things um, I'm involved with a whole series of PhD programs in my institution. We call them think tank PhDs. We call them that because we think of them as the intervention of ideas in fields of practice. So, you know, they're, they're sort of, of different ones. The main question that we're, we're, we're sort of preoccupied within these programs is how would we possibly envisage what people need to know, right? So in, in a kind of conventional model, you would have some clear notion of what people need to know in order to do, you know, whatever it is that they need to do, write a dissertation or something. But in these intersections between practices and knowledges, one of the things you absolutely cannot envisage is in a clear and organized way what people need to know. 
Because the, the point about the disenchanted is they know a lot. They just don't want to know thusly, right? So the, 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 the sort of the point is not substitute this body of knowledge for that body of knowledge because they're going to operate similarly. The point is substitute some, some mode of, of putting knowledge on the table, you know, of exposing knowledge in some other way where you're saying, okay, in the field of curating, let's say one of these PhDs is called curatorial knowledge, it it's operates in the field of curating, and, and you say, not what do you need to know in order to be a curator, but what, what are the, the sort of, of, of urgencies of the day that you need to find points of entry into? One of our, our PhD students said it beautifully the other day. She said, I get up every morning knowing that my task is to fight global capitalism. And I go to sleep every night knowing that I have failed in my task. <laughs> what are the, the, the tools and the agendas available to me to enter this fight obliquely? Right? And I think that's the, the sort of notion of perception. The, the, I, I'm very, very, very suspicious of an educational model that knows what it needs to do. Because, you know, the educators get educated all the time. The, 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 uh, for example, when we started our department, we were all incredibly academic. And within 10 years, we, each and every person in the department has developed a practice, right? So people are making films and they're curating and they're organizing and they're programming and they're performance artists and, and so on. And it's not because they're such a creative bunch and they're exploding with creativity. It's because we all realized that whatever questions we were dealing with, we couldn't deal with them just in one way. Academically was not enough, theoretically was not enough. We would have to test them in different ways. And that is, I think, what I'm talking about. And therefore, what do you need to know in order to do this is an irrelevant question. I think maybe enough. Thank you so much.